Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Good. It's a big day for the Edmonton Oilers. Mm -hmm. They pulled off. I don't know if there's like 100% approval of the move, Bruce, but in terms of moves that the Oilers made, Mm -hmm. even the crabbiest people on social media from what I saw were positive about this you know even the ones who think they could do a better job of being the GM or the president of hockey operations than anyone else on earth at least from what I saw um, you know that fairly enormous group of people um, were content and from official sources around the NHL you know from real from the 300 hockey men and women Mm -hmm. Um, there was nothing but praise for the move. So this is um, Connor McDavid's agent, Jeff Jackson, being named as president of hockey operations today. Uh, CEO of hockey operations. Okay, CEO. It's a new new title, so we're waiting to see where where that fits in. Taking over, essentially. They're saving president for Ken Holland, maybe. Uh, Okay. Taking over for... Bob Nicholson, who uh, is now has the Pat Quinn role, special advisor. The Ken means, Hitchcock role. Ken Hitchcock role. I actually think Ken Hitchcock might have actually consulted with the team, mm-hmm. but I don't know if Pat Quinn ever did much after he was let go. So anyway, uh, Bob Nicholson out, Jeff Jackson in. Uh, Bruce, what's your initial take? Uh, well, I'm quite positive. As I wrote in my in my second post today about uh, the actual media avail guardedly optimistic and for me i'm actually optimistic but i'm saying guardedly because i know this is the order so something usually happens but uh this is uh uh it's kind of came from out of left field and i guess there was talk that nicholson might be uh bob nicholson might be stepping back and uh there was other talk that he might be replaced and now we have you know amalgam of the two but rather than go out and do this detailed job hunt a uh, you know a job search that people think the organization should do when an important position opens this sounds like a very proactive move done by the team and where they have dealt with jeff jackson for a number of years they know the guy and somebody said hey that guy would be real good for the for the you know the brendan shanahan role on this team you know there's a a lot, a lot of teams that have that sort of front, uh, the front guy that's not signing contracts, but he's very big in the in the grand scheme of things. And the organization knew the guy, and you know, in a different capacity, uh, but knew him well, and, and uh, they clearly targeted him. And they had Paul Coffey go out and uh, uh, what's the word when somebody actually goes out and sort of recruits recruits the guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it was a very much active. Uh, recruitment with Coffee representing uh, Daryl Cates, and it sounds like Coffee's going to be the special advisor to the CEO of Hockey Ops. So he's got a ha- new handle now. And uh, uh, but bottom line, the uh, the new CEO of Hockey Ops, uh, he left a pretty good impression with me. You know, like he had a good presence, and I wasn't in the room, but I was virtually so, and and. He, he seemed very composed, very thoughtful, very serious. He barely smiled just one or two times, which hopefully he lighten up a little bit. But uh, he seemed very focused. And uh, he didn't come across as like being full of himself. Uh, but as um, he's one of those guys that's, you know, changed careers a few times along the way and taken on a challenging new career and succeeded at it. I mean, he was an NHL player for eight years. Then he got his law degree. Then he lawyered for eight years and then he became assistant general manager of toronto for four years like toronto drafted him out of uh, a law firm the same same way that the oilers did with uh um brad holland and they've got and then he got those years in toronto and then after four years he started up this agency that's become quite successful and he himself of course is the agent of one Connor mcdavid so that's his in with the team. Like he's been around since before Rogers' place was a hole in the ground. 
you know, like he's had a, his top client is an oiler. He watches a lot of games. He comes here quite a bit. And so he has, <clears throat> and he talks to McDavid quite a bit. And you can. He said he's well, seen imagine. every oiler game. He's got views. Oh, wow. Amazing. He's seen every, every he told Stoffer that on his interview with Stoffer. He's uh -huh. seen every single game the Oilers have played since McDavid's been on the team. Wowza. Well, he should be up to speed then on the team. And. He, what he said was, I'm not just going to come in here and and uh, reinvent the wheel. That uh, I want to see how things run. I want to watch Holland up close and see what he's doing to run the team. Expects to learn a lot from Holland, and that's a good attitude to have, even though technically he is Holland's boss, as I understand it. Uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's got a veteran mentor there, and he's got Holland's got one year on his contract. So uh, Holland himself said. He's playing it one year at a time, and he says he always does. It's all about this season, and then, uh, uh, you know, he's got lots of energy, he said, but he also has lots of other things he wants to do with his life. And he said it's not ultimately, he says it's not my decision, giving a very meaningful look over towards the uh, the new fellow. <laughs> but it looked like they got, they were quite comfortable. And, of course, they've, uh, 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 they've been working together as, you know, superstars GM and superstars agent, you know, with the, with the roles that they have uh, uh, for four years now, starting with just when Holland took over. That was right after McDavid banged up his knee and against the post after Giordano cut him down in Calgary. And he entered that offseason with a huge question mark. Surgery, no surgery. Is he going to be able to rehab this? And so the club... The agent, everybody associated, the doctors, they had to work very closely together right away. So he and Holland, and for that particular thing, they weren't competing with each other. They were on the same team. Everybody wanted McDavid to get better, right? <clears throat> so, and so they they have apparently a, a very good and and uh, uh, working relationship, and and so th to me, there's a lot of positives. This guy's coming in as an outsider. Uh, but an outsider with, uh, you know, a lot of cross experiences and also as an outsider who has a specific, you know, a particular interest in this team. And, then, you know, it's not like he's he's uh, coming in here and says, well, I had to look up Edmonton on the map. And all I could tell me it was near Calgary. You know, it's like <laughs> he, uh, he knows the team, like you say, watched every game. And so he's got a big running start at at this. Reminds me, of Sam, not the same, but similar in the way Jay Woodcroft had a big running start at being the coach because he knew a fair bit about what was going on here and about players and such. The elephant in the room, of course, is as McDavid's agent. Um, you know, it's funny. I just, Frank Saravalli was just on orders now. Mm -hmm. saying in his estimation there's a better than 75% chance that McDavid and Dreisaitl would both sign with the Oilers. And I wrote a post on that saying I, I think that that's, that's um, accurate. That's a, that's a solid assessment. I wrote, I hope that Saravalli has some inside information on this. Well, maybe he knew about this. Yeah. If he did, though, he might have said 90 to 95%. Because, Bruce, it strikes me that in terms of um, checking that box, and, and doing all the right things that you can to try to secure this, the signatures of Leon Dreisaitl and Count Connor McDavid on their next contracts. This was a masterstroke. This was brilliant. It's the, you know, the person in hockey that you'd, one of the people in hockey that you, you I would guess, and I don't know this, but that McDavid would trust the most, you know, his agent since yeah. he was 15 years old. Yeah. Um, and this is an agency, he, uh, Jackson mentioned this on his interview with Stauffer, that just doesn't represent the players in negotiations. They have a player development aspect to them. Dave Gagne ran it. They hired Dave Gagne because he had developed John Tavares and his own son, skills, Sam. He was a skills coach, eh? He was a skills Sam. coach in the NHL. And they hired him for their firm to develop the skills of their players, which is like <laughs> more than the Oilers ever did. Um, for a long time, have have that kind of skills coach and that kind of focus. So the, here's an agency that was ahead of many NHL teams, very innovative. Um, and, you know, he's worked with Connor McDavid ever since Connor McDavid was a boy, essentially. So, um, man, that is just, 
you can't overstate. You know, if they were if they were thinking of who to hire, he just checked so many boxes. Yeah, he's, he's got he's hockey experience. He's he's got legal experience. He's a former player. He's an AHL player. He's a hugely successful agent. He is a self-made man in all of those areas. He had to work his way up in all those areas. Jeff Jackson isn't a magical name in hockey. I mean, he was in a mar- he was a marginal player on a terrible team, the Quebec Nordiques of the late 1980s. And um, you know, he he's come out of nowhere essentially to become one of the most powerful people in hockey. Even before he had this job, I don't know where he was on the list. I have to look that up. The hockey media industry. had him 24th personally, but his agency collectively, like they're all listed as, as separate guys, right? And uh, uh, there were several of them that were in the among the top agents. Well, I, I'm talking about like the most powerful people in hockey. Those lists, like the oh right, system. okay, I'll, sorry. I'll just I'll just look that up right now. But he would he would be on that list, um, I'm sure. And um, so Bruce, it's just. You know, it's not, of course, it's not sure. It's, there's mm-hmm. no sure thing nope. in hockey. Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl could still decide to leave. And as I wrote in my post today, if that happens, like, that's that's okay. They're adults. This is There's this proper CBA in place. It's their decision, right? If they decide Edmonton isn't the place for them, I don't think we should be a bunch of butthurt Oiler fans like we were with Pronger leaving or when Gretzky and Messier were sold. The circumstances would be entirely different, I think. And um, I know that not everyone's going to agree with that. Maybe even you don't agree with that. But that's how I that's how I'm going to try to take it with that in mind. Like, the, come on now, this is a different era. These are different circumstances. And and even with Jackson on board, who knows? But man alive, Bruce, this is a brilliant move. If you want to keep these guys, just and here and here's how you know this is a brilliant move. The 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 whining, the crying, and the belly aching that would have come out of Edmonton if Jeff Jackson had signed as CEO or P O H O uh, or head of hockey operations, whatever it is, L A Kings with the L A Kings or the Anaheim Ducks or some other team, we would have been well. You would have been pulling your hair out. I would have been bashing my head against the wall. We all would have been like, oh. Why didn't we like? Why didn't the Oilers do that? Like, what's going on? This is this is a disaster. Mm-hmm. That that would have been the reaction, mm-hmm. and and instead, it's like mm-hmm. it's like in a summer where nothing happened, mm-hmm. the biggest thing just happened. Thing just happened. You know, the the biggest, smartest, uh, sharpest move that Daryl Cates could have made to secure the future of the Oilers franchise, he just made. This is a uh, this for Cates. And just think about the money on the line for Kate's in, in terms of franchise value, yeah. uh, playoff dollars, and regular season sales. Those tickets are expensive. I like I talk to people who have them. You know, even the very very well off people struggle with whether they should keep them or not. Even with McDavid in town, it's they they are it is so costly to go to an NHL game. So so for Kate's in terms of the business plan for the orders, this was like. Signing up McDavid and Drysdale is everything. It is a, it is a, a, you know, I'm guessing it's a two hundred million dollar um, move for Cates himself, if not more than that. You know, two hundred million to five to five hundred million. When you when you include franchise value, it's immense what getting that player to sign is going to mean to the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, I think Cates took a big step in making that happen today. Yeah, well, it sounds like it was his initiative and his emissary, Paul Coffey, that was doing the the uh, thing, and, and uh, it was uh, it wasn't like a, a a league-wide job hunt for the best candidate. It was they saw someone and said he'd be perfect. Let's get that guy. And I'm not going to find fault with that. I mean, if it turns out for the bad, it's going to turn out for the bad. But I can't uh, find fault with that approach. Uh, if you think that's the guy, then get him. You know, what's the point of having five interviews if you still wind up going back to that guy at the end anyway? And it's, uh, uh, he impresses me that he might be that guy. You know, like he, he seemed to really have his feet planted on the ground and his head on the shoulders and, you know, no grandiose, no grandiosity about him at all, just matter of fact. 
you know, it seems like a progressive guy. It looks like, you know, 21st century man. Uh, <laughs> actually had a beard. When was the last time I always had an executive with a beard? Was it uh, Barry Fraser, I guess, was it? Yeah, he looks anyway. a little like. <laughs> the, um, power, the power glasses look, you know, David. Anyway, uh, but, but he seemed to be in command, but without being uh, commanding. And, you know, and with his wealth of experience, like, I can't think of who is it that he's not going to be able to talk to, you know. He's already talked from the agent's point of view with the teams, with other agents, with, you know, the development leagues. He, he mentioned how they, uh, uh, not only do they have a player development program, but they have their own scouting program because they're trying to sign the best young kids when they're 14 or 15 years old, like McDavid was. Yeah. So they're scouting. They have their own scouting network going at his firm, and clearly it's paid some dividends. He's, the, the firm landed some very, very good hockey players. So I can see uh, Connor McDavid as the fourth most powerful and inf influential person in hockey, according to um, the Hockey News. Uh, I'm still trying to find Jackson here. Mm -hmm. I can see like some people, like the second that was mentioned that Paul Coffey, went out to him like there might have been a few of the old boys club references I didn't I wasn't looking too closely like complaints but you know it's not like Kate's Kate's and Holland have been around the NHL forever they know the people who are probably qualified for this kind of work it's not like your analytics guy or your assistant oh. GM or even your GM it's a it's a high management position it's a very limited pool of people that you should be looking for this kind of role Mm -hmm. um you know for all we know they did sit down there with a list of kates and holland and maybe someone else with 10 people and talked among themselves about each one who they all knew intimately and well and they don't need to interview them all i mean that, that probably wouldn't happen anyway so no i just in terms of process um you know the kates's initial process was um in trust in trust trust in kevin Lowe. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work out. It didn't work out because Kevin Lowe made a poor choice in his GM pick in Steve Tambellini and, um, you know, downloaded that work to Steve and he just wasn't up to it. He wasn't ready uh, to be a successful GM. They moved fairly quickly, it seemed, with Shirelli and Nicholson. A um, bit more defensible choices, probably with both of those, both of those picks. And same with McTavish, but it did seem like a fairly quick mm -hmm. process in both cases um, where Nicholson didn't have NHL experience, for for instance. Mm -hmm. Jeff Jackson has NHL experience. He does, four years. Nicholson, Nicholson didn't. So that raised questions. And, um, you know, Shirelli had won a cup in Boston. So anyway, yeah, there'll be process questions. I don't think, I don't think that's on the, on the tip of everyone's tongues right now, that mm -hmm. idea. And I don't think, I, I think... Again, I just think they hit they hit a home run. It'll be a grand slam home run the day Dry Seidel and McDavid sign. That's when we'll know if this this move was really um, the right move to make. Because that's how you're gonna judge. That's how you'll judge this well, this Cates, uh, Jackson, Hall, and who's ever in charge. It's the most important thing now, other than winning the Stanley Cup. But if they win the Stanley Cup, I think then you get them to sign anyway. Then then they'll sign anyway, probably. But uh well, I like they, asked, I uh, they asked him about um, Drysaddle on his way out of town saying basically next year, Stanley Cup or bust. Uh, and, of course, Drysaddle will, at the end of next year, be down to one year from unrestricted free agency. And he just c calmly played that down in the sense of, uh, you know, like some people... It's a figure of speech. And they thought, yeah, and that's he basically said it's the figure of speech. He really liked the co player's competitive angle and that if that's his attitude, great. You know, you want the guy absolutely all in on uh, on winning that cup. Uh, and it's... So he said, but that's... I'm not going to worry about the choice of words. Or, it's, it's his goal is this year and that's everybody's goal. Okay. Here, Holland talked again and again about how he's his goal is, you know, this immediately upcoming season is... Obviously, his circumstances make that he, even more focused than usual. Yeah. Um, so, Bruce, uh, he um, he mentioned the A-word, analytics. 
Ah, so I don't really turns- know what, um, what 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 his views are on analytics. Would be interested to hear that. But that's that's good. I mean, hockey teams have got to um, invest in this. There's a whole new level of now analytics with um, the video that they have. The, you know, the chip in the puck and in the uniforms, the player tracking. Uh, it's just extremely complicated, and you need to be up to speed on that. So. Um, We'll see where where he heads in that direction. Um, Here's the exact quote. Uh, they asked him about what it, what uh, things he was planning to do in the organization. He said, "I'm not coming in to reinvent the wheel. I hope that I can bring some different views on the agent side of things. You use your own player development. You do your own scouting of young kids. You use analytics. I'm going to do all of those things." And he, I. The thing about the guy in that position, uh, he doesn't necessarily have to do analytics, but he has to trust that it's part of the overall process uh, to make the team better, that you should have analytics people for the same reason that you should have scouts or you should have player development people. You know, there's, 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 there's definitely a role for it. And if he's a guy that understands that analytics can work to the team's advantage, and hires the right people and then listens to those people, which is often uh, where things come apart, uh, <clears throat> then to me, that's, you know, that's a step the Oilers can make. Like, they do more analytics behind the scenes than I think a lot of people credit for them uh, or rate them for doing. Uh, but there is uh, uh, pain, plenty little evidence that they're keeping up with the top teams at the top and I would like I would like to see as a you know analytics sort of I was going to say bent a uh, sloped person that you know and it's one way to parse the game might as well use it uh, watching the games another way might as well use that uh, but they uh, uh, I think they have some catching up to do, and they need the right guy in the right position. Now, when you got Brad Holland, who I think made had some influence this year, and it's hard to say this decision or that, but their overall approach, and he certainly in his interviews demonstrates, you know, a pretty sharp understanding of it. So, uh, hopefully, another step in that direction, and uh, the owners can start cooking with gas on that front. Yes, indeed. Um, so Bruce, I was already working based on Sarah Valley's um, commentary. I had already been digging into uh, what McDavid and Drysaddle's con- next contract might be. You know, based on the se- better than seventy-five percent chance that Frank Saravalli thought that they would come to stay in Edmonton, and because um, it's coming up fast, yeah, you know, Drysaddle has two years left on his deal. That means next July they've got to re-sign him. And um, the July after that, they've got to resign Connor McDavid. So dry settle comes first. And what I was looking at was th- th- this is a rare class of player, Leon dry settle and Connor McDavid. When you look at career value, like their careers to date, mm-hmm. as, as I was, you know, and I have a way of rating it. I look at MVP awards, Con Smythe awards, and MVP voting. Because you're looking at just the very, very highest end players cream of the crop the cream of the cream of the cream and Connor mcdavid already ranks in terms of career value 15th overall he's had the 15th best career in nhl history already without winning the stanley cup um, with his three heart trophies and and placing well in other years um, the only other players in the top 50 right now are Sidney crosby who ranks fifth alex ovechkin who ranks 14th mm-hmm. um Evgeny Malkin, I don't have his ranking in front of me, and Eric Carlson, who ranks just around 50th. And players who might... And McDavid was... 15th. 15th. Already 15th overall, just behind, one point behind McDavid, or behind uh, Ovechkin. So, and other, there's only a handful of other players who have a hope of moving into the top 50 in their careers, and they are players like um, Kel McCarr, Victor Hedman, Nathan McKinnon, Austin Matthews, Leon Dreisaitl. Right. Um, Adam Fox, David Pasternak, Andre Vasilevsky. So um, 
this is a very small group of players. And when you look at the very top players, the good news is this, that they tended on their first contracts, they tended to take up a fairly high percentage of the cap. But Crosby, Ovechkin, and Malkin, um, their percentage of the cap on their second contracts all dropped. Mm. And I, I and I think what happened was that, um, first of all, they'd become immensely wealthy on their first contracts. Yeah, they had a lot of money. You know, they were in the, you know, at least the, probably the, at least the 20 million, 20 millionaire, you know, $30 million after taxes right. kind of category. So they, they were set for life essentially already. And they started to value winning the cup. They sure. started to think the less I take, the more left over for other players on this team, which has got to be top of mind ever uh, for any player who want, whose focus becomes winning the Stanley Cup. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and has the luxury in a way of thinking that way because most players don't. They just have to go for the money because their careers are short and they're difficult and they can get injured at any moment. They're not set for life. But Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, you know, the difference between them making um, $16 million a year and $13 million a year, let's say, mm-hmm. um, does it really mean in the long run that much to them as opposed to $6 million more a year in cap space for the Edmonton Oilers being able to use that money for one more star player that can help or, you know, two really good players that can help you win the cup? And that's something each player will answer individually for themselves, and we don't know the answer. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, I think that both McDavid and and Drysaddle show signals that they may be willing to, wherever they go, um, be it Edmonton or another city, take less, no. take less, because they're just so cup focused. And when that becomes your obsession, as I think it is, especially after this year, after the bitter year where they got outplayed and outcoached against Las Vegas and gave up a golden opportunity to win the cup. It's just got to be such a bitter loss. And I think that um, they, we also might see this trend hold true that we saw with Crosby, Ovechkin, and Malkin um, taking less on their second contracts. Mm-hmm. Now, or I guess it's their third contracts after their right. EL, ELC. Yeah. No, that's the one to one. Now, Carlson went up a bit, but it's a little different because Carlson... Um, wasn't when he signed his when he signed his uh, second contract um, after the LC um, his first big deal he wasn't yet a true superstar and he only signed for six point five million a year he wasn't yet Eric Carlson you know Hall of Fame hockey player right. when that happened so he was looking still to completely I think cash in and secure his future and he's now done that and he. He's got such a huge contract that it's making him impo- impossible to, or very, very difficult to move in a trade, even though he had a phenomenal se- season. Um, so we'll see what happens there. He's the exception, um, mm-hmm. but um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the trend will hold and that we see McDavid go the Crosby, Ovechkin, mm-hmm. Malkin. It's going to be my next post will be on this. Well, Crosby, as I recalled, he signed a was it a five year deal for eight point seven million dollars, a very precisely chosen number, and then he signed a five year deal for another eight point seven no. million dollars. No. So I think his cap hit again. He signed the when he was after his ELC. He uh-huh. signed a five. You got the first one right. He signed okay. a five year deal for eight point seven million, okay. and the cap percentage was seventeen point three percent when he signed okay. that contract. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how that's. That's how cap friendly rank, ranks it from right. the day you signed the contract. Right. Mm-hmm. What's the percentage of the cap in that yeah, moment? It's nice. He signed us. He signed the next contract when he was 26, and it was a 12 year deal, Bruce, which he's still on. Oh. And it's it was for 8.7 million a year, same amount of money, but by then the cap had gone down, and mm-hmm. he was at 14.5 percent when he signed right. it. Right. Yeah. No. Since that's what then, I mean. It's some that money really, was really okay. Long I got contract. The term wrong. That really. The percentage of the cap now that 8.7 million is is it's not close to 14.5. It's I don't know what that would be now. It would be closer to 10 percent or 11 percent, oh. I think, of the cap. So he's um, yeah, closer to to um, just over 10 percent. Just yeah, just over, just over yeah, that's right. So he's he's really he put himself in, in a position to win the cup by diverting money to other players, and frankly, Bruce, it worked. 
um, it, it helped. It was part of the equation, at least. Both him and Malkin, who also took a little bit less, not as much as Crosby, but took less. You know, they won two cups on those second contracts and um, two Stanley Cups after they signed those second contracts. So um, compared see, to I Kane and second, Saves, I, never I, won again. Contracts, I should be saying third contracts. It's confusing because there's the ELC mm -hmm. contract. There's your second contract. And I'm talking about the third contract, which is what it's going to be for McDavid and Drysaddle, their third NHL contract. So, yeah, on the third contracts, they won two Stanley Cups each, um, having won one Stanley Cup on their first uh, in their first uh, go around. Anyway, that's I I just fingers crossed that's what's going to happen, and and it's it's kind of what needs to happen if the Oilers are going to compete. I I if if McDavid and Drysaddle go for the maximum amount, amount of money. Um, that they, they could get, because they can get it mm -hmm. somewhere. They don't sign an Edmonton. Some team would pay, pay them the maximum. Um, I just think that would make it really hard for um, that team to compete for the Stanley Cup if you're paying, well, it's, let's say it's 18, 19 million pl for a player, whatever the cap is when McDavid signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't seen a max yet under the entire, during the entire cap era, we haven't seen a max contract player yet. And McDavid, when he signed, he actually, because people thought he could get, I think it was 15 million at that time. And he went for, and there was talk he was going to agree to 13.25. And then he actually signed for 12.5. So there was talk he'd left a little, little lining the nest for, uh, to sign dry saddle with or to sign other guys with, you know. Well, didn't they sign the same summer? And didn't dry saddle sign for, or did he sign second? He, he signed no, second, even though his contract was up first. McDavid was, you know, in the, yeah. after two years, he was eligible to, to extend, and he did. Whereas Drysaddle was an RFA into the summer, and then eventually they signed the big deal. Now, I'm just looking at another counterexample for you, David, of uh, Kane and Taves. You just got to look at one because they kept getting the same contract. And they won one in their last year as an ELC when they were like $850,000 players, and then uh, plus a few bonuses. Then they signed five years times 6.3. They won a cup in 2013, another one in 2015. Then they signed eight years at 10.5, and Chicago has won squat since barely any playoff series, never, never mind a Stanley Cup. And it's because of, they're working from this, you know, I got 21 million on two players. And I remember when the Oilers got that same 21 million for their two guys. And and thinking that's a lot, and I didn't like what it did to Chicago, but I'd rather have two young guys getting better than to have two guys whose best years are already behind them. Not, now you're paying deep into their twilight years. And so that's uh, uh, where they got huge raises, $4.2 million each. And so that Chicago hasn't been the same since that happened. Yeah, it, and so, yeah, they went from 11% of the cap to 15% of the yeah. cap, both of them. So, you know, 22% of the cap on two players to 30% yeah. of the cap. And it did make it hard for Chicago to compete. And and again, like their their second contracts, excuse me, their, yeah, these would be, their second contracts weren't quite as rich. Hmm. Um, as they were good David's, contracts. Yeah. Like David Crosby and Ovechkin also all had huge percentages of the cap on their second contracts. Crosby was 17.3. Ovechkin's mm -hmm. was was 19%. And McDavid's was 16.7%. Um, so they those players on their second deals, and Malkin's was 15.3. On their so on that second contract, they already went high. They, you know, mm -hmm. um, whereas Taves and Kane went low and then they went higher on their next ones. So it might just be a psychological thing where if you've gone a little lower then you you think well it's like the darn old nurse saying i want to get paid i really want to get paid now and um that's and and that's certainly what happened with with taves and kane i wonder if if you asked them if you could do it again you know would you have been content with something more like 8.7 each mm -hmm. like like crosby got would that have would that have worked mm -hmm. or not and again we don't know and I, i'm not going to blame anyone for taking the money i i think Money, obviously, money is important to people, very important, and, and um, that it's a personal decision. But it does, in the in a cap era, it has ramifications. Jeff Jackson, by the way, was ranked um, 66th on the Hockey News 2022 list of the most powerful and influential people in hockey, 66th. Okay. So this was, so this is a yeah, guy. Moving up from there now, I would expect. Yeah, he's clearly, uh, 
he's clearly on the list already, right? Like they're not. Oh, no, that's impressive. I, I, I never thought of him in those terms. Terms, of, but that would be you know the agent of the biggest star player. It does have a lot of pull. And in, so, I looked up by the way. All three of uh, Ovechkin, Crosby, and McDavid had won the Hart Trophy by the time their ELC was uh, was up. Hart Trophy. So yeah. they were known commodities. I mean, if you win a Hart Trophy during your ELC years, it's pretty easy to project that you're going to be a pretty important player for a long time, as all three guys have uh, proven to be. And, and, and interestingly, um, neither Kane nor Taves are in that top 50 career value. Mm -hmm. um, they're both obviously really Hall of Fame <laughs> hockey players, but they are not in the top 50. They're outside of that. In terms of MVP performance in the playoffs oh, yeah. and regular okay. season, yeah, um, they haven't garnered a lot of. Kane won the MVP one year, but he hasn't garnered a lot, and uh, and he, Taves has won the Conn Smythe one year, I believe, but they haven't done a, they haven't done well in the voting outside of that uh, for the Hart Trophy. The McLeod uh, Bruce, are we done with uh, Jackson? Any final thoughts or anything you'd like to add? Oh. Just looking forward to hearing a little bit more from this guy. Like he, I think he does have an interesting vantage point and an interesting viewpoint. And uh, I think, you know, he's coming in tangentially or at oblique angles to his things because of his past experiences. And uh, if, you know, he's on the ball like he seemed to be today, uh, you know, in terms of, the actual decision making process, you know, I, I like what's sort of underlying uh, in terms of what he brings. And all that said, one of the most impressive human beings I ever met in my life was uh, during Oilers Dev Camp in 2012. They introduced their uh, head coach for the next upcoming to be locked out half of season, Ralph Kruger. And Ralph Kruger blew me away with his uh, just his per well his personableness, <clears throat> but just his um, his worldliness. He knew a lot of stuff about a lot of things, and he had a really interesting and intriguing viewpoint. And I was quite excited about him as a coach. And yeah, <clears throat> so. Well, but but Ralph Kruger. <laughs> You're not the only person who's ever been blown away by Ralph. Oh Kruger. no, I'm aware. I mean, he's, he, he would gives, blow anybody away. I he, think. Like Mr. Ted Talk. I mean, he is mm -hmm. the closest thing, is he not, yeah. to the real Ted Lasso? Like yeah. he, he went from <laughs> being a, a hockey coach to being the chairman of Southampton Football Club. Yes. I mean, who does believe. that? That's a, that's the Ted Lasso yeah. story yeah. essentially. Well, not not exactly, uh -huh. but it's a. He, Ralph Kruger is an amazing individual. Yeah, yeah, he is. So, uh, yeah, and you know the the uh, I like Jeff Jackson's um, Twitter um, avatar. Mm -hmm. He's got a comic book image of himself, and and above his head is a light bulb, and his fingers pointed up like like this, and as a light bulb. So just like it, his self image, mm -hmm. uh, the image he presents to the world, is of something a, a good ideas person, mm -hmm. someone who who yes. loves ideas, obviously. Yeah. And um, that's fantastic. I mean, I don't, I don't see as Ken Holland or Brad Holland or uh, Keith Gretzky as Steve Stills as any kind of troglodytes of the mm -hmm. NHL. Like they're not like locked into the past. But it's it's great to have someone right. who's been at no, the cutting no, edge. Progressing, I think. Yeah, it's great to have someone who's been at the cutting edge of the agent agents business for a decade here, um, mm -hmm. having such a pow powerful position in Edmonton. Yeah, I just thought of who he won't be able to talk to, though. The referees. <laughs> can't talk to those referees, and you won't hear from them either. <laughs> and why can't he talk to the referees? Well, they, like he wouldn't have had any past experience that would involve uh, directly with, with that group. Oh, so, and you see that his as agency. A, uh, well, we could have hired Colin Campbell, I guess. Oh, uh, <laughs> he was an oiler. 79-80, expansion year oiler. And he was a tough nut. I My one experience that. with uh, Ralph Kruger was he was telling me one day about hockey analytics, and he said, it was about, I think it was about scoring chances. And he said something like, you want your top line 
three plus for our sake of argument plus four on scoring chances in the mm -hmm. game right you want your second line to be plus two mm -hmm. and you want your third line and your fourth line to saw it off zero that mm -hmm. was his philosophy mm -hmm. jeff jackson i also had a one interaction with i i had uh been criticizing sam daniel his player oh. and he sent me a fairly sharply worded uh, uh -huh. criticism i can't remember what he said actually and he, who knows he might have been right maybe i was unfair to sam Gagne. i mean we do strive to be fair and accurate mm -hmm. but i was awfully hard i'm awfully hard on those centers who don't cover the front of the net and, <laughs> and sam Gagne was fairly high on that list for a long time he was a serious puck watcher on the defensive side and it got him in so much trouble it really did, so. really did. Anyway, Jeff Jackson didn't like that, but he was standing up for his oh. player, which is exactly what he should do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I bet he uh, didn't use any bad language or anything no. like that. He just probably said professional courtesy kind of approach. That's what, everything I got off him today is that's how he talks to people. It was, it was fine. All right, Bruce. The Oilers have made one other move this week. They've signed Ryan McLeod to a two-year deal at two point one million dollars per oh. what do you think well a little bit more than i was thinking at the beginning of the summer and maybe a little bit less than i was thinking after that guy in chicago um Khrushchev signed for two and a quarter million dollars and i thought no, oh, name no. Is McLeod, yeah yeah that one mcleod was probably going to get at least that much from the arbitrator uh but you know what if i'm a player and I've asked for arbitration. I am extremely nervous about taking it all the way to the arbitration because if the arbitrator rules against you or partway against you, then the team has the option to make it a two-year contract and not a one. So, yeah, imagine if you're going. I mean, you're you're negotiating as if it's a one-year contract, but the, the 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 side that didn't file for arbitration can double the term after all is said and done so if the team files for arbitration which happens very rarely and uh they lose and have to give the guy too much the guy can say okay i want that for two years but in this case that that's one of the things the players <clears throat> especially you know year four and five where where um Bush is that's a that's a big uh risk or where uh, mcleod was and so uh, agreeing on a number that's close, and certainly he understands the situation, but uh, uh, he, uh, I mean, he tripled his pay, more or less. So I think uh, uh, the team did well by him. I think they were smart to do two years, because each of the last two seasons, that you know, McLeod's been at a little bit of a, of a flash point you know, each of the last two summers he's you know unsigned well deep into the summer two years in a row so next year he doesn't have to worry about that at all neither does ken holland or whoever the gm is at that point uh, so getting that second year is is uh is big there but even the year before that like at the end of his elc and he kind of made the team out of camp except they sent him down because uh he was waiver exempt and they had Brendan Perlini and Tyler Benson. And they thought if we wave them and lose them, that's it. They're gone. So let's keep them first and give them a good shot at it. And we can send down a cloud here, clouder with no, uh, uh, with no problem. And we'll get them back. And of course they did get him back after a little while, but he was down there for three or four weeks and not because of anything really he'd done wrong. It was just, he got caught in the numbers game and then he got caught in the numbers game on his, cheap contract last year and so now he was you know you don't want that guy getting a chip on his uh oilers tattoo you know you want the guy just to, to so they had to treat him uh fairly this year they went through the process they got a deal done both sides apparently satisfied good let's move on we got a good young player for two more years He's he uh, he's a promising to me as a third line center. Bruce. Mm -hmm, very much. He, he um, I mean he's big and fast. He's got some skill. Like you can see him getting like 30, 35 points mm -hmm. in a season. Most of that at even strength. Mm -hmm. But he's 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 a pretty smart and conscientious player as well. And I think mm -hmm. um, you know the center has a huge role on defense, covering the defensive slot, helping the defenseman. Mm -hmm. And he shows a willingness and an ability to do that. He's pretty good at it already. 
and I think it can, can get better. So I, um, I, I've heard Ryan Rashog's uh, on Got Your Back uh, talking with Jason Strudwick about a, a possibility mm -hmm. of a, like a Dylan Holloway, Warren Fogel, Ryan McLeod line. Mm -hmm. And just three big, fast, skilled players. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I, bought, I might be more inclined to have a shutdown line. Like I, I really like Derek Ryan and Matthias Janmark. If you could find a center for them who could um, check as well, then you'd have a line that you could throw it against tough competition for faceoffs in your own zone. And they're just one center short of that. If you could mm -hmm. find that, this Oilers team, um, well, it would be just that much better. I mean, it's already, I think it's a fantastic team that they've put together. And mm -hmm. um, they are this one forward short. And it's, I don't think that forwards Raphael Lavoie necessarily, especially now that he's taken a contract. That could keep them in the AHL. We'll we'll see. Yeah, where I, I'm not going to let that sour me on the player, but I sure do think it was a poor decision by him and his agent. You you could but, go with McLeod between those two guys though, mm -hmm. and have Dylan Holloway and Lavoie and Fogel as a, as another line. Well, anyway, there's lots of they'll, they'll probably try Hol everything. Holloway and Fogel were uh, companions an awful lot of last year. They played over five hours together over the course of the of the season, and they had pretty good results. And, you know, they, they're they a little bit better than break even on the goals front because they're not exactly great finishers and they don't tend to be on a line with another great finisher either. Uh, but they, uh, they control play to a significant degree. And what I found really encouraging about uh, uh, McLeod this year, just from a, from a statistical uh, point of view, is his percentage of shot attempts on the ice for was pretty level at about 54 percent which is really good for a bottom six player 54 percent but all of the types of numbers that uh measure um shot quality uh like uh danger fenwick that uh, puck iq uses or high danger scoring chance that natural statric use or expected goals uh all soared by like five or six percent for this player from you know 50 to 55 kind of in that range uh meaning that the process was getting better that he wasn't just taking these sort of empty calorie type shots but are in his line but they were actually getting in and creating good chances they just weren't burying quite enough of them uh, but uh there's you know a real real statistical sort of surge in 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 the supporting numbers that suggest that you know everything he got on the year which was you know career high in, in goals and points despite missing 25 games and uh, uh the first plus positive plus minus in his career and the first positive plus at five on five so good progress and uh, uh he was a good value at 798,000. But now he's got to rise to the new challenge. And this was something we saw last year when the Yamamoto and Pugliarvi both went to arbitration or went the route. And both of them signed before, as McLeod did. And then both of them just couldn't seem to get the job done as $3 million players that they were doing okay as $1 million players. So the pressure is different. And, you know, anyway, we'll see. I think... Uh, I have confidence in McLeod that the order's got a useful player and he's got enough utility between center, wing, power play a little bit, penalty kill especially, but just his overall impact on team speed. Wherever he is in the lineup, he makes the orders faster. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's worthwhile just in its own right. All righty, Bruce. Well, the last piece of business seems to be Evan Bouchard. They still got to mm. sign him, a former... Um, um, uh, what's his name's agent? Jeff Jackson's Wasserman agency um, represents him. I guess it's Dave Gagne okay. who's negotiating. So we'll see what happens there. Um, we'll see what happens there. There's um, not been negotiate a sweetheart deal there. That'll be good. Yeah. Well, th uh -huh. you know what? Three point nine million for two years would be good. That'd work for me. I I don't like. A, I know that what he gets paid, it, it means the difference between a, one more player being on the roster all year or not, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think they're going to be playing with fewer players than they had hoped would be my guess. Yep. So, two-year deal, that'd be great. And I love yeah, the two-year deal for McLeod. Year. It gives McLeod this year, Bruce, mm -hmm. not to worry about scoring or anything. Mm 
Exactly. Just worry about winning, worrying about being a winning hockey player and a better hockey player. Mm-hmm. And um, he's not going to be paid on points based on his play this season. And I think that we that may really help focus him on what's what he needs to round out his game because it is um, it's not point scoring. Right. The points will come for Ryan McLeod. He's just got to he he's got to become like a shutdown defensive player, and that's where the, his real value to the Oilers will will become apparent. Yeah, no, I mean his game's still a work in progress. I mean he's always had the speed and the ability to transport the puck uh, from D zone all the way into the O zone, uh, but some of the defense specific skills always being on the right side of the man as opposed to usually being on the right side of the man, just sort of you know get on the yeah. inside of the guy, uh, improve on his face offs and get him up and over fifty percent and. Ideally, yeah. like his brother, get him up in the high 50s. Uh, his uh, right shot brother is an ace on the dot. Uh, and his right shot brother is also older than him, been around a little longer. And as we all know, face-offs experience is a, is a part of that. Uh, and just sort of honing his consistency that he's, you know, having, uh, you know, that his bad games are, are one-nighters. And, uh, you know, trying to avoid um, slumping. Like, I, I, I just feel like there's more there with this player. He's shown us plenty. And I think if he showed us what he shows us, but, you know, all the time or close to all the time, he would be very good indeed. All righty. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there for tonight. And um, maybe when after Bouchard signs, we'll, we'll uh, reconvene. I know. All right. Coming next week, apparently, when... Uh, when Dave Gagne comes back from the Halinka tournament back there you to go. Canada, he's the negotiator for. So don't hold your breath that it's going to happen tomorrow, people. Bruce, thanks for talking. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>